Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have returning guest, Ron Miscavige Sr., author of Ruthless Scientology, my son David Miscavige and me. Ron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeffrey. I'm glad to be on. Ron, you have been all over the Internet, all over Twitter, all over social media because of your book. Uh, Sales look like they're really strong. It was uh, number one New York Times bestseller. Ron, congratulations on being a New York Times bestseller at 80 years old. What does it feel like to have a best-selling book? Out? I mean, when when it happened, it was the first week that the book came out, and I got a call from uh, St. Martin's and um, the two girls there that are, I guess you'd call them my publicist, said, okay, you got to sit down. We've got some great news for you. And I says, okay, I'm sitting there. Says, you know, your book was number one bestseller on the New York Times list, and I was happy that it was, but in a way, I thought, and I'm not saying this to be, uh, you know, egotistical or anything, but I thought it was going to do good because I think the story was worth telling, but I was also happy that I got a lot of uh, push because I was on 2020, I was on Late Night with Seth Meyer, I was on with Megyn Kelly, uh, Good Day New York. So I had some, a, a lot of big exposure on these uh, national media things, well, except for Good Day New York. Well, I guess that's national television, too. So I, I kind of expected it to do well, but to be number one, I guess if you come right down to it, that was a, a very pleasant surprise for me. But I thought it was going to do well. Yeah, because Scientology is very much in the public mind. And, you know, Ron, I've learned that uh, people love details about Scientology, and your book is detail-rich. And it is amazing that your first, first book is a New York Times bestseller. That's a tremendous life accomplishment. A lot of people write books that never make it anywhere. But so, so it's tremendous. And it, it told an important story. And for people who haven't read the book, I urge you to, to buy the book and read it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, what I wanted to do on today's interview is I wanted to get details about life at Gold Base. So could you tell our listeners what Gold Base is who may not know the term? Well, it's short for Golden Era Productions, and it is located in Hemet, California, and there's over 400 acres of land. It's divided by a road down the center. There's the north side of the base and the south side of the base, and there's facilities to make movies, to record uh, lectures, well, I'm not saying to record lectures, but to mix L. Ron Hubbard's lectures to get them in pristine form so every word could be understood by the public buying them. But uh, technical films are shot there, commercials and various things. And uh, that's the whole purpose of the base, to produce the, the audiovisual products that the church puts out. And you live there along with working there. You... Uh, there's birthing that it was built that's actually quite nice. Uh, so you live right there, and there's messing facilities where you eat. And the place where you eat is called Massacre Canyon Inn, or MCI is short of, for that. And, uh, yeah, that's where I lived and worked for over 26 years. It is Jeffrey, because before we go any further, that place when did an about face from the time I got there until... March 25th in 2012 when I escaped. It, it was not the same then as it was when I first got there because even though you worked hard in those early days, we still had some time together as a group. Uh, we'd have nice holidays and spend some good time together. We worked our asses off, to be honest with you. But there was some pleasure in doing this because there were some rewards. But this slowly uh, did an about face. And toward the end, it was just a grind. It was a very gray life living that way because you'd wake up in the morning, uh, go to work. Uh, you'd have breakfast usually in the morning. You'd go on study. At noon, you'd have lunch, and then you'd go to work in the afternoon, have dinner, and go to work at night. And that was seven days a week except for Sunday morning. You had uh, CSP, which is Clean Chip Project. That was a time when you could do your laundry and clean your room. This was seven days a week, and every day of the year was that way. The, the occasional little freedom you got was maybe on Christmas 
you had some time to spend with each other. In the early days, sometimes you'd have two days off for Christmas. Toward the end, maybe would have a day off or would have the morning off, work in the afternoon and have the evening off and watch a movie. But it, it turned from a hardworking day uh, with some pleasure involved into a literally a, a gray life, a very gray life. It sounds almost like prison. Uh, or in fact, Ron, for a 100-hour-plus work week, what were you usually paid? Well, in the beginning, when I first got there, we were paid $30 a week, and then some years later, it jumped to 50 But that wasn't necessarily on a regular basis. I mean, there were many times when you'd go for weeks and months without getting paid at all. And I remember the CEO at the time said, well, don't worry about it. It's a forced savings program. You'll get the money later on, which never happened. So we're, we're talking about pennies an hour, and it's true. You, you got your food. You had your birthing. You'd get some clothes and warm winter coats and stuff. But my friend, you know, $50 a week, you, you can hardly do anything with that. And plus, you weren't allowed to go off the base to get some amenities in life. You can get it at Walmart and uh, – you had to stay on the base and buy things on the internet or buy it at the PX. Yeah, that's that's very confined, and that's one of the characteristics of a cult is isolation. Ron, I wanted to clarify something, and this is kind of funny, um, and this is important. I ha- I feel I ha- I must do it. I must do this as part of my duty as a broadcaster. The city of Hemet put out a tweet that said. Just for clarification, the facility is not in Hemet. <laughs> so the church, the church of Scientology's reputation is so bad. And I want to let listeners know, generally it's in the vicinity of Hemet, but actually it's in an unincorporated air, uh, part of Riverside County. Uh, it's near San Jacinto. But, yeah. but it was very funny. It run, it run around uh, Twitter that... Uh, Hemet doesn't want to claim Scientology. They're saying no. They're not, they're not in our city. Don't besmirch the name of Hemet. I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. Listen, when I look back at uh, my time there and uh, having to buy things at the canteen, so I would need to go off the base because the fear was that if I got off the base, I'd escape. And um, Kind of reminds me of when I was a kid growing up in Pennsylvania. And let me just tell this, you this story because um, my dad used to take me into the woods. I was born and raised in a little town called Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania. And it was in the coal region. And we would go into the woods when I was a little kid and we'd pick wild mushrooms or various other things that we might, my mother might make, make jams. But with the mushrooms, I remember her putting them in jars. You know, she'd can them. And one day we're walking through the woods and I saw this kind of a framework and you could see there was a building that burned down, but the cinder blocks were still there. And I said, Dad, what's that? He says, well, that used to be a Molly McGuire's headquarters. Hmm. And I said, what was Molly McGuire? He says, well, when the mines were in operation in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the mines were owned by these. Uh, I guess you could call them tyrants. They built houses for people to stay in, very cheap, very dilapidated. The miners would go down into mines and mine coal, and at the end of the week, whatever dynamite they used, they would have been charged for this before they got paid, or they'd be charged for their shovels or any other things they used, and what was left over, they would get paid. And these people lived a very poor standard of living. And the Molly McGuire, as a matter of fact, the the coal mine operators had a police force that would keep people in line. The Molly McGuire's was an insurgent bunch of people who used to fight for the miners' rights. And (laughs) I don't know, in some way, the people who have walked off that base and are taking them on remind me of the Molly McGuire's back in the coal region trying to right the wrongs that people have been subjected to as being part of the church and especially part of the, especially the sea organization. I don't know how you'd relate it to it, but to me it's, it's a good relationship. And the other thing is 
the miners would get paid in script. So they had to spend their money at the company store and pay for the things with the script that the mine owners gave them. Ron, that's a very apt historical analogy because Sea Org is very much like the company store. Yeah. You, li- you live on company property. Uh, you know, you can buy things from the company canteen. They don't want you to leave company property. Gold base, it's called, sometimes called int base for international base, which is a different unit at the base. You know, they right. have the, the razor wire fences. They don't want you to escape. They want you to spend their, your money there. So it's like, it is like a company store where you're basically an indentured servant or a slave. And if you leave, they want to charge you a freeloader bill for the training yeah. you've had. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's just, it's just egregious. Now, switching gears, that's the part of Scientology that people don't see, the inhumanity, breaking up of families, disconnection, fair game, character assassination. And I think people like you, Leah Remini, Mark Headley, Amy Scobie, Jefferson Hawkins, so many who I consider heroic former Sea Org members are publicizing this. Even, even Laura DiCrescenzo in her lawsuit. And they're showing the public the part of Scientology. Scientology doesn't want you to see. What they do want you to see are celebrities. And based on our last interview, I've got some questions from listeners. And I wanted to ask you, we begin with celebrities because that's what Scientology likes to trot out, celebrities. Right. Now, one story that goes around the Internet, and, and Mark Headley's talked about it, but uh, Tom Cruise had this romantic fantasy of running through a field of wildflowers with Nicole Kidman at the base. Were you right. there when the field of wildflowers was planted? Yes. And was it in all hands? I mean, what was the whole thing about uh, let me tell you something. Everybody on that base went and worked like fiends. I have never used that word, but <laughs> I, I got to tell you, it was like, you got to get this done. And when you get a bunch of people who in their hearts, most, if not all of them, are there because of wanting to help other people. Look, that's as far as I'm concerned, the hook in Scientology is when you first get in, you do certain things that do increase your ability, and you can go out and demonstrate this increased ability in life, especially communication. You, you hone up your communication skills. You find out what the communication cycle really is about, and just with that increased communication skill, you do improve your capability to handle life and interpersonal relationships. Now, you see that it's helped you. You then want to recruit other people into it, to help them. And after years and years and years of being inculcated into this one thing, you know, we're here to save the planet. We we can help every man, woman, and child on the planet. And truthfully, I guess if you came right down to it, if every person on planet Earth improved their communication skills, you would have helped them. That's not what's going on. So now you get a bunch of people who have wanted to help their fellow man, so they joined the Sea Organization and are devoting their existence to this, You get everybody with that one common purpose that they have, and you set them loose on a field to plant, I don't know how many acres of grass and flowers and everything, and I'll tell you something, it happened. It was unbelievable to see it get done. We, Everybody was proud that they did it. Now, this is really nuts to think about it. The ostensible purpose of Scientology is to save the planet. But then it becomes planting a field of flowers so Tom Cruise can romp through it with his beloved. And a couple things. That's not a uh, valid use of tax-exempt dollars. They get, you know, Scientology has tax exemptions so they can plant uh, fields for the romantic fantasies of a movie star. That's a form of inurement. It shouldn't happen. Uh, whatever happened to the field, did they keep it or did they plow it back under? When Tom had his romp? You know, I'll tell you something. It's such a blur. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what the hell happened, but I know that it did happen. It was planted, and uh, it it just doesn't come to memory. But it was definitely off dead center. I mean, to be very gracious, I mean, it was nuts. Yeah, it seems like a big waste of time. Well, that that. Oh, wait a minute, Jeffrey. What? It seemed like a big waste of time because it was a complete fucking waste of time. Period. <laughs> okay, point I mean, t- point taken. <laughs> yeah, 
I can't argue with Ron Miscavige Sr. on that part. Yeah, and, and which brings us to another question uh, listeners wanted me to ask you. How close are David Miscavige and Tom Cruise? Well, they're very close. I mean, they're, they're very tight, very good friends. And, uh, hey, I got no criticism of that. I mean, if two guys have a lot in common and, you know, they, they want to share their time together and just kind of have a great conversations at time and, you know, ride motorcycles together. I, got, I don't have a problem with that. But I can tell you, Tom Cruise thinks that David is the top spiritual being on the planet. I mean, that's he holds him in tremendous awe. Really? That, that, that's about David, absolutely. Now, David Miscavige is uh, chairman of the board, Religious Technology Center. Within the right. Church of Scientology, would it be fair to say that he is viewed as the most important living person on the planet, second only to L. Ron Hubbard? Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> and now that L. Ron Hubbard is no longer around, he is viewed by that top echelon, especially, let's say, RTC, which is his personal force as the top guy. And then, of course, the organizations around the world, the churches in various places, they, highly, they hold him in very high regard. You, you've got to remember, the thing that he did that turned Scientology around is he got the church tax exemption with the IRS, regardless of how he did it. He did get it, because at that point, if that would have been kept in force, the church didn't have the money to pay what the IRS was demanding. So he did turn that around, and he got that. And because of that, it was his stepping stone to power, I can tell you right now. Well, definitely it cemented his legacy yeah. uh, as inheriting the mantle of L. Ron Hubbard. Part of the story I want to tell, and, and I am working on uh, the story, is how what I call the shadow men. There's a group of non-Scientology tax lawyers like Monique Yingling who yeah. worked behind the scenes to help David Miscavige get tax exemption. But but within the church, yes, the war is over was the defining event of his career. Uh, yep. For new time Scientology watchers, could you please tell them what the Religious Technology Center is that uh, David Miscavige heads as chairman of the board? What What does RTC do? They are protectors of the tech. I'm, I'm talking in very broad and at the same time specific duties they have. They're supposed to make sure that the application of L. Ron Hubbard's tech is done 100% standard. And if I stop talking at that point, it would be an accurate description of what they do. Sure. And Whatever, and it, it's just absolutely... Do not alter a word. And, of course, David is their immediate superior. And, of course, within that, he has uh, some people who would be his personal staff. But RTC, Religious Technology Center, is to protect and safeguard the fact that Scientology is delivered standardly throughout the world by anybody, any organization, any auditor, period. So, you know, by analogy... Uh Anywhere you go in the world, a McDonald's hamburger tastes the same. So, right. And that, that might not be the best example, but Scientology, theoretically, anywhere you go in the world, the auditing should be the same. So it's a quality control part of it. And it's, it's, absolutely. An, it's an important part of it, as, as L. Ron Hubbard set it up. Now, um, one thing I wanted to ask about that I got a question on, uh, Tom Cruise's birthday party on the free winds. Uh, Mark Headley reported the cost at about $400,000. So David Miscavige wanted to throw Tom a birthday party. Stacy Francis sang at the birthday party. You were in the band. What was the whole, what was the, what, what went down at the birthday party? Well, I'll tell you, um, it was a surprise for him because I'll give you an example. An example. At the time we used a public drummer. Uh, yeah, it was, a guy is fabulous at the drums because we couldn't use our own drummer. He had a condition where he couldn't come to that gig. He was he was considered to be PTS, okay? So yep. we used this public drummer, and then I was told, hey, we're going to put on a birthday party. This guy flew home because he performed with us the week before, which was 
uh, a week of a maiden voyage. I called him. He had just landed in Los Angeles. And I said, Tommy, you got to come back. He says, are you joking? I says, no. And I can't even tell you why you have to come back. But you got to come back right now. And we have a plane ticket ready for you to turn around. He trusted me that much that he just turned around, came back. And when he got back, I told him, listen, we're putting on a birthday party for Tom Cruise. Hmm. And I remember telling Stacy Francis that she's going to sing at this birthday party. And she was completely knocked out. I mean, this was like she just died and went to heaven. You know? I bet, yeah. So uh, all those preps, when I, I don't know what the cost was. Mark would know better than I would. But as far as picking the numbers... That entire set of music was worked out, so uh, it would be the most pleasurable moments for Tom Cruise. And uh, he walked in a room, and the band started playing, and he was just floored. And he sat up front, and I remember looking at him, and he jumped up on the stage and started singing with Stacy at one point. So <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I mean, this is you don't ever have things like you don't have things like this happen every day. But he was knocked out, and it was a, a fabulous success. I do remember that. And so David Miscavige was quite pleased with it. He was com he was knocked out with it. You could just see him up front that he was he was at his best, and he wanted to present this with Tom as a birthday gift. And Tom, I think at one point mentioned it was the nicest birthday gift he had ever gotten in his life. Wow! So a lot oh, of things. By the way, by yeah. the way, as a little as a little aside, Katie Holmes, right? Yep. Prior to this, she wanted to record a song and present this as a, a on a CD to, to Tom. And David got me to go to L.A., the Mad Hatter studio, and produce her singing this song. Wow. And I did that. And Katie came in, and she went in the studio and started singing it. And she came back, and we listened to it, and she says, Jesus Christ, man, this doesn't sound good. And I said, Katie... Here's what I want you to do. Don't hold on to the notes. This is what Frank Sinatra do, started doing when he got older. It's what Tony Bennett has done. Hit the note and get off it. Because if you're not singing on a daily basis and you're not trained, if you hold on to the note, it'll show those little frailties in hitting the note that you have in your voice. She went back out in the studio, did it, and it come off like a million bucks. Ron, how is Katie Holmes' singing voice? Does she sound great? She sounded incredible. She was real good. And she was a delightful person, just really a nice individual. You know, you meet people who are nice individuals, you know they're not faking it. As an individual, she's genuinely a very nice individual. When I say that, you've met people who are trying to be nice, and you can see right through the facade. Sure. She will she wasn't trying to be that way. That's the way she was. Oh, that's a and great the time thing to say. The time we spent in the studio was delightful. And she took, an, you know, the little bit of a change I had her do. It wasn't much. So I'm not taking credit for her doing a great job because she has a very nice singing voice. But that little thing, like if you were to sing something like, I've got you under my skin. If I held on to the note, you'd hear little frailties in my voice because I'm not a professional singer. And this is what Frank Sinatra did as he got older. And if you listen to some of the recordings, that's that's how he uh, kept that style up. He changed his style to that, and it came off great. And that's what Katie did. And we had a delightful time. She sang on the show, and she came out and sang the song that was on the CD, and it came off just as good. It was great, great time. We know the number one rule in... Uh any kind of business or corporate life or any kind of life is to make the boss look good. So it sounded yeah. like you made the boss look good. We made him look incredible. Tom just absolutely was knocked out. Now, what I would add to that, from my perspective, uh, as the author of the Scientology Money Project, that's ScientologyMoneyProject.com, that would be called an excessive benefit. If you're running a tax-exempt religion, you can't give excessive benefits to one person. So yeah. these are these are disallowed. This is one reason I focus in on Scientology's tax exemption. You can't give a four hundred thousand dollar birthday party because it doesn't have a public benefit. 
Well, so, so no, it didn't have a public benefit. And I, I don't know if it cost that much, but if Mark Headley said it did, he would know because he was in charge of, uh, well, he had a high executive post in the church. You know, sure. that. although they're saying he was no good from the beginning. That's bullshit. They're the <laughs> one who put him in the post. Well, well, <laughs> he's very capable as an individual. He could get things done. Ron, I'm glad you said that, you know, because you take these executives in the church who leave, and then once they leave, they were nobodies. So you have yeah. Mar Marty Rathbun, who was number two man, Inspector General, Religious Technology Center. I mean, yeah. that's second only to Chairman of the Board, RTC. And then yeah. you have Mike Rinder, who was in charge of Office of Special Affairs. Once they left... The church was saying they were, you know, low-ranking nobodies. And, but it's interesting how you can be, uh, in the words of Frank Sinatra, riding high in April, shot down in May, so to speak. <laughs> so you can, be, you can be a church executive high and mighty one day, and the next day you're a bitter, defrocked apostate and the worst person in the world. Yeah. And, and no, Mark put that event together. Look, I know Mark and Claire. Yeah. Terrific people, tremendously professional. Mark is very skilled at what he does. Uh, you know what sounds, very cool what sound people. systems. Yeah, and so yeah. Th that's why uh, we we people like you and I, Tony Ortega, my wife Karen, everyone else, works to expose the Church of Scientology for what it is and to counteract the lies it constantly puts out. Now, going back to Sea Org. At Gold Base, before the show, you mentioned, and I was surprised by this, you worked a lot of overnighters, but one time you said you and Peter Schles stayed up for 82 hours straight. What, what happened? Yes. How, how do you even do that? Well, I'll tell you something. Um, I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And we were doing a theme for uh, St. Hill. And this started with Peter and I working out the theme itself it was going to go on a video. Um, it was, it, well, it went like this. Da, 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 do, 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 do. That was the theme. Just that little snippet that I just sang for you. Mm -hmm. And working out the theme, the rhythm section, having people go in the studio, record this, and make this last, and it broke into when the saints come marching in, in the last part of it. I remember that. This was about a nine-minute video, and it went from dead stop where we were standing at the starting line to 82 hours later, we had a mixed piece of music. And I know that it was 82 hours because I remember when we started, and I looked at my watch, and I said, Peter, we've been up for 82 hours. Now, I don't mean that we slept for a couple hours here or there or nodded off. Because I would keep him awake, he would keep me awake. And we were up for 82 hours straight, and we finished this thing. And, of course, we went to bed, and we felt we were great because we did this. Let me tell you something. That greatness is mixed in, mixed in with a touch of insanity. Because to work for 82 hours, you just can't do that. Well, we did it, though. Yeah, that, no, that's that's... That's insane to do, but uh, you do what you have to. I've the longest I've stayed up is forty eight hours, yeah, forty nine hours, and that was uh, birth of my first child, and there were some complications and things. And I got to tell you, at at about forty five, forty six hours, I felt like I was starting to hallucinate and see things. You do, you and, do feel that. Thing. And I slept, I don't know, sixteen hours. What? How long did you sleep for after that stretch of? I don't know, maybe a, maybe about 10 or 12 hours. But I'm going to tell you something. On retrospect, now that I'm talking about this, and I haven't thought about this before, probably what kept us going was the fact that we're working on an artistic project. If we were working out the design from a building or maybe working out how to put some electrical circuit together in a piece of audio gear, I don't know if we could have done it. But the mere fact that we had to keep on creating and creating this project and it was music and it was a piece of art. I think that's what was the fuel that kept us going. Well, sure, because, I, you, because you're artists and you would do that. I, Ron, I used to have to stay up long hours on tests. You know, we'd be testing like a new laser system at work or something. And it was just easier to stay up 24 or 30 hours to just run the test and get it done. 
Yeah. But it was drudgery, so we would smoke cigars and drink coffee. Get yeah. you get the term wired. You would just get wired and kind of like yeah. by like at 24 hours, you're just tired, but you want to finish the test, and there has to yeah. be data. And it it wasn't fun like that. It wasn't play. It wasn't composing. So, no. but but it shows the the work ethic that Sea Org builds into people, and you know people who leave the Sea Org have one hell of a work ethic. I'll tell you that. Uh, my wife Karen can work like yeah, that, no, nobody's business. L- let me give another little example. We we redid the studio several times, okay? And the one time we were redoing it, we had to cut off all the power in the studio itself, and there were yeah. two people. I'll just name them Luigi and Bruce. They're laying on the floor and talking about some component and some wiring that they had to work out. I had a flashlight. It was the only light we had in there. And I would shine it on Bruce, and he was awake, and he'd say, well, now, uh, Luigi, how about such and such? And Luigi was sleeping. I'd wake him up, and he'd say, well, Bruce, what I would do, and Bruce would go to sleep immediately. This is nuts. That's how it went. Ron, One guy would help start talking, the other guy was sleeping. He'd go to sleep, and the other guy would start talking. Now, Ron, the people in Sea Org would fall asleep. They would just fall asleep from exhaustion. Yeah. And well, that's uh, what it was. They had already been up probably about 24 or 48 hours, and it was just a grind. I mean, literally a grind. Sure. I, I remember trips that I would make to uh, Europe, and you know, you, you – uh, Long story short, you know when you travel internationally, you go you go to Amsterdam or wherever. Sometimes yeah. you're up, sometimes you're up 24 hours because of flight delays, weather transfers, whatever. And out here, outside of Scientology, that's exceptions to life because most nights you get eight hours of sleep. Yeah. And uh, but in Sea Org, you don't get eight hours of sleep. Nope. And in fact, you developed a medical condition and that was the only way you were able to change your sleep schedule what happened with your health well what happened is one day i had heart palpitations i don't know maybe it was like 12 or 13 hours straight and i went to the medical liaison officer and i said listen we got to do something because this is this has me man i'm worried about it so she sent me to see well i went to see dr dink and a lot of people in your in the audience would know who he was and he put on me what's called a Holter monitor, which is a recording device. You hooked up with like little EKG patches on your chest, and you wear this for 24 hours straight, or maybe it was two days straight, whatever. At the end of that, you take it in, and they listen to what's on the tape. And at night, sometimes my heart would beat, would go up to 180, 138 beats a minute while I was sleeping. So he basically said, listen, you have a condition here that you just can't avoid doing something about it's not dangerous but you can't avoid it because whatever you're doing to cause this you got to back off on and what it was was I was smoking too many cigarettes and drinking too much coffee but I think it was an inherent weakness in my genetic structure of my heart itself so I did that and that kind of handled it and uh, one of the things he told me is you got to get more sleep you just can't be doing these overnighters so because of that I was allowed to get a couple hours of sleep extra a night yeah and that's a, that's so important um and and sleep deprivation is physically harmful in the geneva convention the rules of war it's considered a war crime to deprive people of sleep yeah and uh the church is guilty of a lot of inhumanity and abuse that if this were a war they would be charged with war crimes and I and, and and I'm not overstating that, the the isolation, the abuse, the psychological duress of security checks. Um, for new time listeners, I just wanted to add a note to your story about Dr. Denk, his importance to Scientology. Dr. Gene Denk, the late Dr. Gene Denk, was Elron Hubbard's personal physician. He was the doctor that prescribed Visteral, the psychiatric tranquilizer for L. Ron Hubbard after he had, had had a stroke. And Dr. Denk signed off on the death certificate uh, for Mr. Hubbard. So, you know, he was the man as far as, you know, medical authority goes. He helped L. Ron Hubbard write the book all about radiation. 
<clears throat> which uh, became the basis for the later purification rundown. So he's an, he's an important guy, and you know, Sea Org members were routinely sent to Dr. Denk. Um, now, people at the base would get would get sick, right? And when they got, when they got sick, I mean, people get sick, right? Yeah, when, they, when they got sick, did Scientology pay for them to see a doctor, or did they send to the county for free medical, or what happened when people Sea Org members got sick? Well, if you let's say had a, a routine physical exam that you had to do, you were probably sent to Megan Shields. And as far as I know, the medical liaison officer would pay for that. But if you had something major happen, it would be worked out that would it would get paid for under workers' compensation. That's how that works. But there listen, was... you'd go to see a doctor. You'd be driven there by somebody else, so you wouldn't go there in a car by yourself, so you, you, you couldn't escape. It just... This is unbelievable stuff to a person who hasn't experienced it, but this is what went on. Rome, what is what is the focus? I mean, this is a thing that recurs over and over in Sea Org. You can't be left alone because you might escape. And so... Well, this, there's a good goddamn reason you want to escape. Who the hell wants to live that way? No kidding. But, I mean, and this is one thing I want the public to know, that Scientology does not... It has to keep Sea Org members as prisoners by actually having them guarded or escorted yeah. or traveling in teams. You know, when I go down to Sunset in Vermont, uh, I go down there to my bank, right? Right by yeah. Pacific Base, uh, Big Blue, the complex, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. I see the body routers out on the street. They're always in groups of two. There's usually like five, though. I The other day I saw five. They were hovering around like... Uh, Salesmen out of used car lot, right? <laughs> they were, yeah. They were waiting for people to walk up. And I was there at the traffic light watching them, thinking, look at the situation. They could run away because they're out on the street. In fact, it's right by the subway. They could just run down on the subway. What keeps them from running down into the subway, Ron? And just escaping? What? Yeah, yeah. Why don't the, why don't the Sea Org body routers on Sunset in Vermont here in Hollywood, right at the subway station, what is keeping them from running down on the subway and just getting lost into the city? Well, first of all, what would they do? Would they leave with no money, sleep on a park bench maybe, or if they didn't have a relative they could go to? What what the hell could they do for themselves? And you've got to remember, this... What's really pounded home is that the only reason that a person would leave is because they have harmful acts they've committed against that organization or person they're trying to separate themselves out from. And this is all the wrong mind is, you know, I don't know how I can live this fail. I wonder what I'm not letting myself in on it. What did I do to start thinking this way? And it's a lie. You can become victimized of another person. And it, it isn't like Anybody who wants to leave only has bad things they've committed or what you call overts against that. Things could get that bad that become life becomes intolerable. But if they left, what money would they have to at least get a little start in their life? That's, that, that's a good point. So, factor. I mean, be, be, because you know, at least they get meals, they have a place to sleep, and uh, they may think about it quite a bit. But to actually pull that off and say, hey, I'm the hell out of here. That's another story. Yeah, and to some extent, they're prisoners in their own mind, but you're right. They don't have any money. They don't have any place to ah, stay. They don't, may not but even hang on. have... Wait, yeah. wait. Yeah. Not to some degree. To the great degree, they are prisoners of their own mind, and that's what keeps them there. And I'll tell you, if anybody's read my book, I describe how you become, how you build this prison in your own mind. You, you, you build your own prison, and you live in it, and it's done a little bit at a time. And that's that, that's well said. And and one thing I wanted to ask you about again, qu uh, questions from listeners. When somebody escapes from the Sea Org, it's called blowing. They blew. Right. Now, when you were at Gold Base, they had blow drills. Practice on what to do in case someone escaped. Oh yeah. Now, what what would you do in a blow drill? But in a practice, is it you know? Did you have to lock doors, make telephone calls? What goes on in a blow drill? 
Well, you, you wouldn't lock doors because if somebody blew, you know, the horse has left the barn. It's ridiculous to close the barn doors. But you would be, let's say you, there was a group of people that had cars. They would be assigned to go to certain places, to bus stations or maybe a railroad station and see if a person's hanging out there. Or maybe go to a relative's house or a friend's house. And you'd try to track down every possibility where the person may have gone. And this this is how it's done. And they check uh, if the person had a credit card. They have a way to check if he spent any money and used his credit card. And that would be a lead for you to go on. Uh, if a person had a cell phone and he stupidly kept it with himself, you could track down where he is just with his cell phone. But this was a, a very well-planned-out drill. And it was, it was called a blow drill, all right? So the goal in Sea Org is if someone escapes is to retrieve them, not let them have their own free will, but to kidnap them back, take them back, convince, persuade, yes. and, threaten them. Here's the, here's the kicker, and this is – now, look, you want to come back because you want to leave the proper way. You want to do the routing out. My friend, that is complete horse manure. There was a guy on the base that routed out properly – I'll just call him Alexander. It took him four years to route out. Four years, okay? Jeez. No. If you want to leave, you just leave. It's done. Then you pay the consequences, like if you have no money or you have no place to go. Okay, well, you contend with that. But that would be the price of your freedom, to, to contend with those things if you were to leave. And uh, if, you, if you're not willing to put up with that or, or contend with that, well, you're going to stay. Yeah, and, and part of routing out uh, leaving the CR by the official way, for listeners who don't know, involves sec checks. You get a lot of sec checking, interrogation. That's and all it is. That's all you get. <laughs> and, and, Ron, what's funny, this is the rumor line, okay? This is unsubstantiated, but, you know, I've got pretty good sources. Routing out right now is taking longer than ever in the Church of Scientology because there's not enough auditors to do sec checking for the amount of people who want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, I would do that. <laughs> anyway, that's what I've heard from uh, my sources in L.A. and Clearwater. Now, so yeah. one, one question I asked you before the show, which was, which was interesting, did anyone ever die at Gold Base? And you said no. Not to your knowledge. Right. So two questions. Any broker who took care of L. Ron Hubbard in the last years of his life, after Mr. Hubbard died, Annie went back to the base, to Gold Base, and then she got she developed lung cancer, correct? Yes. So so what did they do with Annie when it was clear that she was terminal? Well, she was sent to L.A., and she had a handler. In other words, she had somebody who would personally take care of her. And also, she was put on to solo nuts. And it was deemed that at that level, if she audited that, she could handle the cancer. Now, for our, our, our listeners, Ron, who don't know, what is solo knots? This is very specific. Okay, this is NED for OTs, Okay. And what it does is it you handle body thetans that are stuck to your body or in your vicinity, and by ridding yourself of these entities, these these entities who aren't up to the level of running their own body, so they they live on your body like like a flea on a dog. Okay. Okay. That, that, and that's what she was put on. And uh, of course, I found out about her death quite accidentally, and I tell about this in the book because. I got a Kindle uh, one time as a present from David, and on that Kindle, there's a five-way switch that, well, you can push it up, down, left, right, or in. And if you're looking up a ward, uh, you you find the list of wards, uh, select it, and then press it to the right, which says look up in the dictionary. I pressed it twice, and it went to Google. And I was on the internet without a filter. Oh boy, that's and that's how I found out about Annie Ken, Annie Tidman dying in L.A. And uh, nobody at the base was told this. And as a matter of fact, just a little incident that happened shortly after that, 
I was out going to the laundry building. I remember where I was, and, and one of the girls there, one of the executives said, Ronnie, do you want to chip in? We're buying uh, Annie some birthday presents. And I said, I'll pass on it. And whether they knew about it and were duped just like the rest of the base, I don't know. Or whether they, excuse me, whether they, if they didn't know about it, they were in the same position as most people on the base. Or even if they did, it would be just to keep the ruse up that she was still alive. I, I don't know which it was. Hmm. But I remember I already knew that she died. That is really something. And then um, when Stacy Moxon died, and people, look, listeners can Google this, Stacy Moxon, M-O-X-O-N. She was electrocuted to death at the base. Right. And what happened with the death of Stacy Moxon that you can recall? What I recall is being told at a briefing in MCI, which is short for Master Canyon Inn, where we had our messing, we had a mess all there. We were told that Stacy loved squirrels, and there was this squirrel that ran down in this trap door. The trap door led to very high voltage lines, like over 400 volts. And Stacy went down to rescue the squirrel, and she accidentally stepped on this and it killed her. That's what we were told. That's absolutely heartbreaking. She was so young. Yep. But it, it, but unless unless they have to, they won't tell you that somebody died. Could, because people disappear. They could go to RPF. They could be flown to a different continent. So part of Sea Org life is people disappear and you don't know what happened to them. And you don't well, ask. Look, hey, listen. When Shelly, all of a sudden she wasn't around anymore, <clears throat> nothing was said to anybody. And then you just dub in, okay, well, maybe she's on a mission. And when somebody goes on a mission, they don't publicly broadcast where they're going or what they're doing, you know? So Shelly Miscavige, your daughter-in-law, disappears. Yep. And you know that you better not ask about it. That's correct. Rom, that is, that is so wrong. I mean, just on a human level, you would be concerned. Of where, course you would. Where is Shelly? Yeah. But not in the Sea Org because, you know, like when, when my wife's son, Alexander Jensch, died tragically at age 27, the church did not have the decency or the humanity to call his mother and say, we're sorry your son has died. Yeah. They wouldn't even do that. And that's what we talked about on, on a previous interview, Ron. Disconnection continues even after death. Yep. And it's it, it just, it's mind-boggling. Now, two other questions we have, because this is getting fascinating. When you were at the base, I mean, switching gears, when you were at the base, protesters would sometimes come to Gold Base to, to conduct protests outside the base. What happened during protests inside the base? Here's what would happen. Here's what would happen. There'd be an all call go out to all the units on the base. You were to go into a building, close the windows, close the doors, and nobody would walk outside or across from the upper part of the base to the, from the north side to the south side. There was a tunnel that went under the road. It was forbidden for anybody to go outside. Meanwhile, the protesters would be out there, and there'd be a set number of people who were stationed in a position where they could see them, or but at the same time become slightly hidden for them. And the protesters would say things like, they'd say things, free say. Free Hebrew gents, free Hebrew gents, and they'd have these megaphones saying this, you know. But nobody was allowed outside of a building until it was over. Well, I mean, Heber was locked up in the in the SP hole, and people knew the the SP hole existed. So you just had to. I mean, after the protesters left, were were you as a CRG member? Were you debriefed on what happened, or were you sec checked to see if you had any bad indicators? Was there any no. fallout, or no. was it just get back to work? Get back to work. Oh, amazing. I, I know yeah. from from talking to Karen that when uh, the Anonymous was protesting in 2008 here in L.A., I protested alongside them. They did the same thing. They shut all the windows, all the curtains, Yeah. and they would go in the tunnels under the street at the complex. So right. life would go on. But see, Anonymous were carrying signs like, 
David Miscavige beats his staff. And they didn't want Publix or Sea Org members to see that. Right. And, and so you know, so again it's it's censorship because you're you're inside a inside a cult. So these you know, if you look at things like blow drills to capture people who escaped, not letting you see content, not letting you look at the internet. I mean it you do start building that prison in your mind because you feel what, that it's dangerous in the outside world? No, you have over a period of years agreed to certain things that you put restrictions on yourself like now you can understand why we have to censure your mail because uh, we don't want anything getting off the base or coming into you that would disturb you from you doing your best possible work hmm. they, well you know maybe I can see that and after a while I think yeah I, I can see why they do that and you don't want to not have somebody on the extension of a phone when you're talking because uh, this way you might miss something, but that other person would pick up on it. it. It's little things that you agreed to, and once you agree to them, they're part of your thinking. So over many years, all of these little points of agree agreement are literally bricks in a fortress you've built, and you have yourself imprisoned in there. So they all they all add up. Now, yeah. Now, w one last question. I really appreciate just being able to ask you, you know, these these questions I get. Uh, one practice that L. Ron Hubbard instituted on his flagship Apollo was to throw Sea Org members overboard, even yeah. throw, even throw Publix overboard, and that means they take you, grab you, and they throw you over the side of the ship into the harbor. Right. It's terrifying. Nothing. It is. Listen. Thank God nobody was killed doing this because I don't know if they threw them off the land side or the seaside, but Jesus Christ, man, going out of three or four stories up. That is terrifying. This one on the gold, but they didn't throw you off of a building. I mean, off the side of a ship, rather. You'd get thrown in the lake. No. And it happened to me. It happened to me. Ron, what happened? When you were overboarded, you don't get any warning, do you? Does it just happen? What happened? No. Well, they'll take you there, and you're allowed to take off your shoes and your watch or things like that. But you keep your pants, shirt on, and everything else. If you have a Nextel, you take that off, or a, a pager, you take that off. And then the port captain would say, "No, we're gonna may your sins be washed away by the sea." You know, it's just a degrading situation, and it's supposed to make you do better. Let me tell you something. All it did was get me to resolve: I got to get out of here someday. This is no way to live. Ron, what did they throw you into? Did they throw you into the lake or the pool, or what did they throw you into? In the lake. Now, they threw me in the lake. Now, this and, yeah, they, they would get in back of you and push you in. You weren't allowed to just to jump in. You'd get pushed in. And it's it's degrading, and you're all wet, and then you take your stuff, and you go back, and you can change clothes. And this is supposed to – yeah, no. Supposedly, you, you should think, well, boy, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to do better. You know what? Fuck you, man. I don't want this to happen to me again. Oh, I, I got to think about some way I'm going to get out of here, okay? I feel the same way, and, and this could happen in the dead of winter when it's freezing yep. in, the, in the desert. Yeah. So over and above the, you know, getting overboarded, thrown into the lake, uh, are, you, are you expected to just go back in and change clothes and go back to work and deal with it? Absolutely. Yes. Just, you know, just things are normal, you know, and <laughs> at the boys' camp, you know, you go throw into the lake, go back to work. Oh, oh, gee, I'm so happy. That straightened me out. Jesus Jeez. Christ, man. Get no, real. No kidding. And I'm, uh, and you eventually, uh, you and Becky have enough of it and you escape, and I'm so glad you did, and you're speaking truth to power, which is very yeah. important to do. I don't care what Scientology you know, says about you, you're a very dear friend, and I don't, I don't care what, you know, and I know what they're doing, Ron, because you're speaking truth to power, they're engaging in character assassination, and you know what? It doesn't work. Scientology, every time it engages in character assassination, is only digging its grave that much deeper, and the public is seeing it, they're seeing Scientology for the vicious, inhumane, greedy cult that it is. And I think uh, the end phenomenon, 
That's a, an Elron Hubbard term. It means when you do a course, there's an end phenomenon. My experience, my observation, Ron, is the end phenomena of the Church of Scientology is nothing left of a person. Yeah. They literally suck the bone marrow out of you and then throw you away when you're spent. Yep. That's not badly stated, Jeffrey. And I can tell you this. There was a friend who actually spoke up for me uh, on the Tony Ortega site by the name of David Haskins when this is last year when they were saying I did all these bad things. And David called Tony Ortega and he said, listen, man, he says, I remember Ron running the band. He made sure we all got paid. He always got us work and stuff. And he told it like it was because he and I worked together as band members. He was uh, my drummer. And he says, it's bullshit what they say about him. You know, he, he took care of his band members. And I did. But getting back to this character assassination or however you want to put it, guess what? I don't care what they say about me. I'm going to keep talking. And I'm glad you are, Ron. And it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Look forward to doing another interview because people want to know what Scientology is like on the inside, and you're such a strong and clear voice for it. And, I, and I'm glad for what you're doing. Ron, one, one last thing. People who, yep. are, people who are still in the Church of Scientology, they are under the radar. They're wanting to leave. What would you say to someone who's still in the church who wants to leave but is afraid to leave? Just walk away and contend with its whatever circumstances you bring about. Just walk out. There is never going to be a time when you say, well, now I'm ready to go. No, just force yourself to walk and say, guess what? I'm out, man. It'll all come out right because you're doing the right thing. Well, thank you, Ron, and it was a pleasure, as always, to have you on the show. Look forward to our, our next interview. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this has been your host, Jeffrey Augustine, with Ron Miscavige, Sr., and as always, we'll be in very good touch. Thank you for listening.